That's it, we're done. That's it. Right. So, uh, welcome, uh, welcome to uh, Mike Altar. Uh, Mike is the uh, department head of uh, psychology. Uh, before that, he was the head of CNBC, Center for Neural Basis of Cognition. And before that, he was at Brown, Yale, and I don't remember where. Uh, <laughs> I, just, I, I wandered around New England aimlessly. Right. I know places. Yeah. Uh, the reason why he's here today is that, as you have heard, uh, the CMU has started a large brain initiative, uh, Brain Hub. Uh, so there is, a, so it's, it's of interest to us in robotics to find out what this is, uh, and in particular to find out how there could be connections to what we do, uh, what we do. Here. So that's uh, the reason why Mike is here. He's going to explain us all this, and he's going to first explain us, I hope, this mysterious title. Okay. Thank you. Um, so the title comes from, I was at a DARPA program meeting less than 10 years ago, and they were discussing um, unmanned autonomous vehicles, particularly drones, and they were describing the state of the art in navigating and trying to hit targets with these things. And uh, it sounded really pathetic what people were saying at the time, and I finally said, you'd be better off ripping out all the electronics and putting a pigeon inside one of them. And the DARPA, DARPA program officer that was running the meeting said, I would kill for a pigeon. <laughs> and um, I thought that was a good comment on the state of the art at the time. Obviously, things have gotten way better. Um, but um, I thought it was just a quote that stuck with me as a um, kind of funny comment on where we are in the relationship between um, artificial intelligence systems and biological systems and <coughs> to some extent. OK, so I'm going to start with a little bit about Brain Hub, just briefly, because people have heard about it, or if you haven't heard about it, that's fine too, just to give you a little bit of background. Um, and then I'll go into some more scientific issues, but it's going to be a very high level talk. Um, people should feel free to argue, Chris will argue with me. Um, so we used to do that back in graduate school. Um, so, um, and then we, but we can move through the different topics I want to talk about. Okay, so what is Brain Hub? So Brain Hub is partially an acknowledgement. We have a lot of core strengths within the university in the study of mind and brain, but in particular, there's this new thing called the Federal Brain Initiative, which involves all of the funding agencies. DARPA actually putting in, I believe, the most money of all of the agencies, as well as foundations. So we're trying to leverage that as an opportunity. Particularly, brain, um, the Brain Initiative is focused on technology and computation as one of its core areas of interest. So there's a lot of new opportunity. We want to foster interactions in the study of mind and brain. More of that on campus. And particularly, we have some CMU core strengths, right? Computational sciences, engineering. CMU is not going to be good at everything in the study of mind and brain, but things we should be really good at, that we should do better as well as anyone in the world, are things that leverage our computational engineering strengths in the study of the mind and brain, which are core problems in many ways. So we want to do that. Um, but we're not going to, for instance, be focusing on a lot of medical, because that's not a core strength of Carnegie Mellon. So, but some things are. And then the last thing is kind of a publicity thing, is that sometimes CMU tends to run a little under the radar compared to other places. And so we want to do a better job increasing our profile and our competitiveness um, relative to other institutions so that we can compete better for funding, for faculty, for students, and so on. So those are all goals. Um, so why Brain Hub? Okay, um, this is sort of why also the Federal Brain Initiative altogether. So there's a multiple different issues that have become very big issues within the community. So one of the big ones is understanding, predicting, and shaping human behavior. If you think about it, that's what Google does. And um, Amazon, of course, and Facebook as well. And if we want to do these things, there's computational approaches, but understanding the mind and brain is going to be integral to how we do that. So being able to really understand and predict human behavior at a deep level, which we really can't do right now, is something that's really important. And the other aspect of that, of course, is building better and smarter and more functional intelligent systems. And there's a lot of interest in this now. Um, I'll refer to some of it later on, but people are interested in better chips, better vision systems, better robots, neuromorphic computing is a buzzword that gets tossed around, and so on and so on. So these are some reasons. Um, just giving you very quickly some ideas of the kinds of opportunities that are out there. Um, DARPA has a Synapse program right now where they um, don't want to really simulate the entire brain, but they want to have the same kind of organizing principles about which biological intelligence is based be somehow brought into um, DARPA's models. Um, Qualcomm bought a company called BrainCorp, and they want to build a robot OS that's based on biological intelligence. And um, they've actually got a lot of brain scientists working with them, particularly from University of California, San Diego. Um, and there may be opportunities between CMU and Qualcomm, hopefully, to, to work with them on some of this as well. Um, and for instance, also IBM and the Haifa Research Labs in Israel are trying to build 
these holistic computing intelligence. And they have this awful diagram of right brain, left brain, which is a myth to begin with. But this idea of traditional computers are kind of analytical thinking and then neurosynaptic chips, which are kind of intui intuitive or similarity based. And together you get this holistic computer. So there's a lot of interest in that kind of thing. Uh, another thing, the program that just was announced, IARPA has something called Microns, Machine Intelligence from Cortical Networks. And again, it's in a combination of computational science based in, in neuroscience. So there's, again, growing interest in these kinds of things. And BrainHub can be a good um, clearing ground for letting people know about the opportunities as well. And so if you're not on a BrainHub list, you're not getting things from it, and you want to know about this, we're going to try and get people on this so they can hear about these kinds of opportunities. So um, who is involved? Um, we have a steering committee. We're not a new administrative structure. We're trying to not be a new department, a new center, none of those things. We have enough structures at Carnegie Mellon without having more. So we just have people represented throughout the university. Nathan Urban from Biological Sciences, Allison Barth, Barth from Biology, Marlene Berman from CNBC and Psychology, VJ from Electrical Engineering, Rob Cash from Stats and Machine Learning, Tom Mitchell from Machine Learning, Artie Singh from Machine Learning, and then Jerry, where's Jerry? Raise your hand. Jerry is our new executive director. And if you want to know something about BrainHub, bother Jerry, not me. Um, <laughs> sorry. But he's great. He keeps track of all of the grants and other opportunities. If you see something that you might think that we don't know about, corporate, foundation, federal, whatever, shoot it to Jerry, and we'll make sure it gets disseminated to people. So really the idea is to foster all this across the university. OK. Um, we have a couple mechanisms. The biggest one which people may have heard about is we have pilot research awards. The idea is we want to foster interaction across disciplines where people who didn't work together start working together. And so we have, we just gave eight pilot research awards. We're going to do that twice a year, about eight or $50,000 for a year for one year. And the idea is you collect enough proof of concept, data, modeling, simulation, whatever it is you need to do that you can hopefully then go compete for foundation, federal or other sources of funding to bootstrap that project. So this is an important thing for us to really, we, our goal is to really have a higher prominence in our ability to compete for a lot of these new initiatives. Um, we're going to support workshops. If you have interesting ideas for workshops that meld issues about biological and artificial intelligence, we'd love to hear them. And we're going to have a workshop call relatively soon. Um, we're going to hopefully have graduate student fellowships yet to be worked out, but there should be a pool of those specifically for students working at the boundaries, which is often harder to get funding if you're at the boundary between your two disciplines. So we want to sure we encourage that. We're going to have a popular lecture series, we hope. Um, we want better co cohesive communications about the grants and the operations and things going on. And, and you know, get it to Jerry. We'll try and disseminate it out there. There's also some new partners we have. We obviously have a great partnership with Pitt. That's long standing. They have a medical school. Many people leverage that aspect of Pitt and some of the other things there. We also have a very good partnership now with Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore. And, um, there really is actually great opportunities to collaborate if you know people there. We just funded a pilot research grant between a PI here and a PI there, but if people know other people there, you should think about possible collaborations. There's also potential collaborations with the University of Warwick, and conceivably also, it's not finalized yet, Sun Nat Sen University in China. So there's going to be new collaborators in that regard as well. Okay. Um, All right. Let's talk a little bit more about science rather than mechanisms. Um, Three goals here. I'm going to start with some of the complexity and challenges of studying the mind and brain. Some of the things we face if we want to study this up here. Okay. Um, so I'd like to start with this question. What do humans do better than machines? Um, and I would argue mostly everything um, from the point of view of actual real world practical intelligence. Um, you know, machines are pretty precise. They're much more precise than people. They're faster, their memory capacity is better, and they're very repeatable in a way that we're not repeatable. And yet, almost any task, of course, a person can do better than a machine if there's any kind of real world natural context. So we have to think about why that should be so, that we're not good on any of these dimensions, and yet we beat machines almost every time. Um, one of, these are a couple of things that are obviously on an exhaustive list. Um, learning from small numbers of examples. It's something people are very, very good at doing, and it's quite striking. Um, People can take very teeny amounts of data and make incredible inferences that allow you to generalize about the world and function in the world in a way that's very difficult for most artificial systems. And I don't think we have a good handle on exactly why that's true. But it's something that people do very well, and biological systems generally. OK. Um, another issue is generalizing across conditions or contexts. Oh, here you are. Woo! No, you can't take it. 
Yeah. You're not oh, allowed to. It's chained down. This is a touch. Oh my goodness. It's because people like you keep trying to steal it. <laughs> I never noticed that before. You never tried to steal it. Never mind. So people are fallible. That's one of my points later in the talk. Okay. They make bad inferences sometimes. Um, <laughs> Someone, someone in the audience is going right now, my robot would have never done that. Um, but um, we're very good at generalizing across conditions and contexts in a way that's quite remarkable. You can change an awful lot of what the world is like and the structure of how you're viewing things, how you're interacting with things, and we can still perform well. And in general, also, we're very good at applying all this knowledge and context that we have, our lifetime of experience, maybe the, the evolutionary experience of all of our ancestors as well, and bringing that to bear and being able to make generalizations and make ta and do task specific kinds of things in an incredibly efficient way. So I think these are some of the hallmarks of biological intelligence. They're not the only ones, but I think there's some things we want to shoot for. Okay, so I study vision. So we're going to talk mostly about vision in this talk. Here's some numbers. I put ACK up there because when I think about them too hard, it gives me a headache. Um, your human retinas, each of your retinas has about 10 to the 8th photoreceptors on it. Okay. And a weird thing happens. In your optic nerve, you have about 100 to 1 data compression, so that your optic nerve only has about a million samples coming through it. So you go from 10 to the 8th photoreceptors at the eye down to a million samples in each optic nerve coming out of the eye. Okay, and that goes into, ultimately to something called the lateral nucleus in your brain. Um, then what happens is something even weirder. You go from LGN to V1, the earliest areas of your visual cortex, and it expands up by 400 to 1. So this is incredible data compression and then data expansion. Okay, and we don't really know why that happens or what it means for the signal. Okay, I can give you some stories about hierarchical processing and nice Tommy Poggio models of, you know, the structure moving upwards in terms of complexity, but we don't really know exactly what's going on. Okay, from about this point onward, the ventral cortical stream, which is your main object recognition pathway, how you ultimately see and understand objects, the number of samples keeps increasing. You've got about 10 to the 9th neurons in so-called higher level visual areas. Okay, it's a lot of neurons. All right. Um, again, there's a suggestion of a feature hierarchy, and people always talk about feed-forward systems. Um, but we need to remember there's somewhere between probably one and a half to two times as many feedback connections in your visual system as there are feed-forward connections. And like, if you want to talk about dark matter, the feedback connections are the dark matter of the brain. We have almost no idea how they work. Okay, or why they work and what they're doing. So, and yet there are two times as many. So there's something happening in terms of context, reentrant, um, reentrant um, information flow, and so on that's affecting the way we see the world all the time. Okay, and just to give you a scale, the entire human brain is about 10 to 11th neurons with about 10 to 15, um, 10 to the 15 synapses or connections between them. Okay. And the synapses, by the way, we treat them in most models as these unitary kind of things with a single weight on them, but they're not. They certainly have separate weights on their input and their output, and they probably have all sorts of other subtle and molecular things going on that we don't understand as well that's modulating them. So the real number here is probably much larger than 10 to the 15th in terms of number of weights or parameters that could be set within a brain. Okay. Uh, I read something recently where it said the 10 to 11th number is a myth because it's a little bit less than 10, it's like, it's like 14, it's not really 100, um, it's not really 100 billion neurons, it's like 86 billion neurons. And they thought there was an overestimate by 14 billion neurons was too much. But for our purposes, we can just call it 10 to the 11th. So, you know, it's a lot. Um, so these are the kinds of things we're dealing with when we talk about trying to understand the mind and brain. All right, so there's lots of ways you can collect data on the brain. And the, the brain project, the federal brain project, in fact, is very focused on this issue. How do we do better methods for picking up data from the brain in ways that will ultimately allow us to bootstrap up and have better understanding of the brain? And I'm going to talk a little bit about them because they're interesting from a data point of view, but they also let you know the restrictions on what we can currently do in terms of understanding how things work. So you can do all sorts of different things. You can have a brain parts list. So you can just define a catalog of all the different kinds of neurons in the brain, you know, like Legos. You have a toolkit of Legos that you're doing, except in this case it's neurons. And people do that. Um, there's something that's called a connectome, and there's lots of different kinds of connectomes out there. I'll give you an example of one, but the idea is it's a connectivity map of how all the different elements are wired up across the entire brain. Okay, and remember that we were talking order 10 to the 15th different connections. All right. You can have a brain activity map, so you can do something where you record activity of all of the neurons, 
And you can try and describe what's happening in a functional sense in response to a given task. And then you could record either from individual neurons or you might record aggregate responses from millions of neurons. And in each case, you would end up with a nice map of where things are happening in the brain when you ask someone to do something or an animal to do something. And then the last thing, of course, is the old style of psychology, which is you can do behavior prediction or analysis. You can build predictive models that, and that try and predict complex behavior of networks, right? Um, and there's also potential connections to a variety of other data sources. We can move down to genomics, protonomics. You can move all the way up to behavioral economics. All these things can potentially connect in as data sources to try and understand human behavior and human intelligence. But we'll stick to these for now. Okay. So there's some challenges with all of these neuroimaging techniques. Okay, one of them is that they can be ridiculously expensive. For instance, one of the most popular techniques for human um, neuroimaging is MRI. The MRI machine costs $3 million. To operate the thing regularly costs $500 an hour. So that means if you run one study, let's say, of 20 subjects, you're spending you know, $20,000 pretty quickly or something. You can burn through a lot of money. Um, this is a huge problem for me. And to me, this is actually the problem in the last 10 years. It's become the thing that's sort of slapped me in the face and said, we have a big problem. We need to improve the way we do our science. And I'm not sure how we do that yet. Which is that the, we have an incredible lack of power. So, of course, in things like computer vision, robotics, machine learning these days, we have web-scale data. People think about training with very large data sets in terms of millions. Anytime we do any of these experiments in neuroimaging, in terms of the number of observations we usually get, they're very small. So typically you'll get thousands of observations, thousands of observations if you're looking at individual neurons. And in terms of number of individuals, the best you might get is a couple hundred individuals in a given study. But you're trying to generalize to all six billion plus people in the world. Okay, based on a study of a couple hundred people if you're lucky. Most studies only have 20 people. So there's this incredible lack of power in terms of number of observations, in terms of number of samples that you're getting. And it's a real issue. We also have this big issue, we have variation. Just like we all look differently, brains look different from one another, behavior is different from one another. We don't really have good models for how you align structural or functional brain maps across individuals. And this is something Tom Mitchell brings up all the time that he thinks is one of the grand challenges. If we could just align across different brains, there's a lot of things we could do, but we really don't quite know how to do that as yet. It's very difficult. Um, and if you don't align right, you're blurring all of your data, of course, and so you end up with a lot of noise. You just low pass everything. Um, we also have an analysis problem. We get these big high dimensional data sets. I'll give you some examples of them in a little bit. These high dimensional data sets um, have an unknown structure. We don't really have a good model of how the brain works. Okay? And so we've got a lot of data and we don't know what we're asking all the time. And I'll talk about that. And then lastly, we have this trade-off between spatial and temporal resolution and also invasiveness. I mean, the ideal things you might want to do involve hurting people so you can't do them. All right. So you've got this trade. This is a nice little chart. Um, these are just different techniques. The one that most people are very familiar with in human imaging is MRI or fMRI. And you end up about here, which means you have a little bit worse than a second resolution temporally. That's the most you can resolve anything. It's actually worse than that, but it's, 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 it's on this range right here. And the spatial resolution is somewhere between a millimeter and a centimeter. Really about three millimeter spatial resolution. Okay, and that's not where you want to be. If we want to really understand how the brain works from all these neurons, we want to be down here, millisecond resolution and mic you know, micron level spatial resolution. Okay, the problem is, is that the following. This little span here is a shift from millions of neurons to thousands of neurons. So right now we're measuring things in terms of millions of neurons when we do this study. We really want to be measuring thousands of neurons. We don't really know how to do that. I can stick an electrode into an animal. I can't do it to a person, right? I can get an electron in a person, I can get millisecond resolution, and I can get this kind of resolution spatially, but I'm not going to be able to get that many electrodes into the animal. If I'm lucky, again, a couple hundred for their whole brain of 10 to the 14th or 10 to the 15th neurons. Okay. So there's a real challenge here about what we do about this kind of thing in terms of developing better methods. All right. So I'm going to give you a couple examples. <coughs> this is um, a technique that a lot of people at CMU started to use called human diffusion tensor imaging. Um, it's an example of a connectome. It's a connectivity map. Um, essentially what you're doing is you're mapping all of the fiber tracks or streams that are information flow streams that connect neurons to other neurons. Okay? And there's a particular technique you're using that has to do with the diffusion of water across um, these fiber track streams. 
But you get a data, you get a data structure on the end which has about 100,000 plus white matter voxels in native space, but that's not the connectivity, that's just the potential sheaths. And then when you look at that, this is for one individual, okay? When you look at that, you've got about 10 to the 6th to 10 to the 7th white matter voxels in the interpolation space when you spread that out in the, when you, when you sample downwards. Um, and each of these voxels is actually a 3D function with 600 nodes in it, so you end up with about this many data points total. And from that, you're supposed to compute which streams are the most critical in some kind of brain map. So you can collect the data, but figuring out how to use this data in some meaningful way is kind of tricky. Again, because we don't have a model at present about what connections we think are critical or not. So it's a challenge. And again, this is one subject. We can collect maybe from 10 subjects. We could give you a couple hundred subjects maybe, but it, it, we don't completely know what to do with it. Okay. There's another example. This is an example of a functional map. I alluded to this already, functional magnetic resonance imaging. If you look in the New York Times or many other places, the popular map of part of the brain with part of the brain lit up, that's what this is giving you. Okay. Essentially what it's doing is it's measuring blood flow in the brain. Um, at, each, at each moment in time it measures about 500 voxels, 500,000 voxels in the brain. Um, the real time sequence, because it's measuring blood flow, is about 10 to 16 seconds per an event. Okay. Um, by the time you're done and you look at the entire data set, you get about 10 to the 9th data points or 3 gigabytes of data per a subject. Okay, and one fMRI data set. People typically focus on one small region. You know, they'll talk about things like the love area or the body part area, and you've probably all heard things like this, or the, the um, moral reasoning area and so on. And they won't worry about all the other stuff going on in the brain. But I can tell you that if you look at this carefully, most of your brain is active all the time and you have this huge data set which we don't again completely understand how to explore. Okay. Any questions? I'm going to shift gears a little. All right. So, I'm a vision person. Here's the problem. Okay. How many have ever seen a carrot car before? Maybe a couple. And you're probably thinking of this guy right here. <laughs> um, um, but most of you haven't. And yet you probably had some idea of what I meant by carrot car, all right? It was some kind of car that, it probably wasn't like a truck hauling carrots, okay? It was probably something that looked like a carrot, but was a car. You didn't probably think it was driven by a rabbit, but. Um, and the reason why I think this is a real problem is it shows how all of our cognitive systems, but the visual system as well, is generative. That it's not just that we learn about images and objects in the world and we can recognize things, but we can also use the constituent parts in a reusable way and we can generate new things we conceivably have never seen before. And to me that's the real challenge. We need to come up with a vocabulary for vision that allows us to be invariant, to be generative, to take into account context and so on. <coughs> and if you think about it more generally, you can think about the baby gets all sorts of stuff in the world sees all these things, right? And here's another example from the same artist for any of you that know that guy. Um, pickle car. Um, and something happens. This says then a miracle occurs if you can't read it. Um, and ultimately, of course, so what the baby ends up with is knowing about cars, pickles, wheels, pigs, and so on. Not just pickle cars. Even though it may have never seen um, a pickle separate from a pickle car. You can induce all these different parts and you can use them in different interesting ways. And this ultimately leads you to be able to generate new things that you never saw before like this. Because you saw a pumpkin before, you saw wheels, you had cars, okay, pumpkin car, right? Um, and I, to me this is one of the fundamental challenges. And it's the big one that everyone sweeps under the rug because people talk about the organization of things like vision, they talk about how early vision works, but they don't have really any notion of how you go from the early perception of what's out there in the world to some kind of reusable feature system that allows you to generate and represent all of the information in the world. Okay. Chris, weren't we talking about this 30 years ago? <laughs> With Whitman? <laughs> yes. Um, okay. So you say, okay, well look, let's just go look in the brain and see how it works. It'll tell us, right? So there's this guy, Keiji Tanaka, that tried to do this in monkey experiments. And he would show the monkey a bunch of different objects. And then what he would do is when he found a neuron that liked a particular object, responded a lot to a given object, he would try and reduce that image of that object down to something simpler. And he would sort of, it was sort of a random walk. He didn't have a particular algorithm. But he did it until he could find something that was the minimal stimulus that still drove that neuron a lot, that the neuron still liked. And he found things like, here's the original image, here's what it liked, original image, what it liked, and so on and so on. And that kind of makes sense. And if you actually look at his whole paper, all the papers he did on this, there's a huge vocabulary of these weird things. 
So you might go, well, okay, there's the language division. These are the features. But it seems completely ad hoc. And in fact, it wasn't even replicable in a different monkey. When you went to the second monkey and you look at the features there, some of them are the same, but a lot of them are really different. Okay, so you're faced with either saying we haven't got the right answer or everyone's basis set is completely different from everyone else's basis set and we're screwed, right? Um, so there's been some more work on this, but not a lot. Looking for what the constituent features are in terms of the physiology within monkey, monkey brains, is not, there's not been much that's been done. It's very difficult. Um, and it didn't really lead to some answer to that question. Now, um, here just to give you an example of how difficult it is, this is a friend of mine, David Scheinberg, who does work in this area too. These are recordings from a single monkey neuron. So here's what gives. He showed these monkeys thousands of different objects. This particular monkey neuron really liked the rubber duck. But then it also really liked the wheelchair. And then I can't even see what that is. Maybe we can see here on the screen. I can't tell what that is. But, you know, it liked some balloons. No, it didn't like the balloons. It didn't like any of these things. So it really liked the wheelchair and the duck. And I forget what, I can't tell what that is. My, eye, my eyesight shot, so I can't tell you. But anyway, the idea is, is, what does the duck and the wheelchair have in common? And this is what he found time and time again. Every neuron he looked at, and here's a whole bunch of them. Um, so here's the best ranked familiar stimulus and the best ranked unfamiliar stimulus for a given monkey neuron. Okay, so this neuron liked these things pretty well. I think these are some kind of pine cones. It liked that pine cone a lot, but then it also liked this butterfly. And, you know, and then you can go down the list. So occasionally you'll go, you'll think you have a moment of insight. Oh, it liked a bunch of things that are kind of similar. And then something else will crop up that's completely dissimilar. There's the duck again. It liked the ice cream cone and the duck. You know, and so there was really no obvious rhyme or reason to how these things get organized. And there's probably embedded, if you could get enough samples, some kind of underlying dimensionality you could extract out. But, unfortunately, like this, this experiment with the mon two monkeys he ran, I think he had about 700 samples from each monkey collected over the course of a year, 700 neurons. And that's typical. So over two monkey years, he got 700 neurons each for the two monkeys. That many observations, that's what he's got to work with. You're not going to be able to do much in terms of finding the basis set from that. All right, so you've got a problem again. All right, so more recently people have tried to do this in functional magnetic resonance imaging in humans, and there's a fellow out at Berkeley named Jack Gallant who's had a lot of publicity for supposedly uncovering this language of how the brain represents things. He has this little model you can go and actually play with it and explore where the, how the brain organizes information. And he has a whole semantic space. So like devices are here, furniture's here, tools are here, vehicles are here, and so on, arrayed across the whole brain. Unfortunately, it's not a description of any of the constituent features. All it is is a description, again, that everything that you know about is somewhere in your brain. And they're not completely overlapping, okay? So it's really pretty and cool to look at. <laughs> But it doesn't really give us any more information about what the codes are at all. And it's very, I mean, you can kind of say, well, biological things are maybe up here, places are down here. But we kind of knew that already, that there's these coarse level structures across the brain. But beyond that, it's a beautiful map, but it's not broken down by any kind of constituent features. So, question? No? Okay. And in fact, he visited CMU, we asked him this question, and he said, oh, that would be too hard. <laughs> he said, I'm not going to try and tackle that question. So, we're really stuck. All right. So, um, one of the things people have tried to do is simulate whole brains. And there's a whole era now of big simulated brain projects. Probably the most famous one is the Human Brain Project in Geneva, Switzerland, at EPFL. Henry Markram. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about them in one second. Again, I mentioned Qualcomm already. They've got a, the, the Brain Corp division of Qualcomm has a model. Chris Eliasmith up at the University of um, Western Ontario has a model. No, is he Western or he's Waterloo, sorry. He's at Waterloo. Um, they've got a model, okay. But for all these simulations, the challenge is connect these big simulations back to some kind of understanding. And in particular, the Human Brain Project, which got this, I forget, how much money was it from the European Union? Four million dollars? Four to six million, a billion. Four to six billion dollars, sorry, I, got, I dropped a couple zeros there. Four to six billion dollars they got for this. There was a big article in the Times last year, people were critical of them getting the money, and in particular Alex Puget, who's a very respected neuroscientist, not someone who flies off the cuff usually, said, um, he says, while the team may have achieved a computer simulation of something, critics say it was not a brain slice. It was completely meaningless, just random activity. Um, okay, the claim that he simulated rat's cortex is completely ridiculous. Okay. Now, so the, obviously the field has a little bit of work to be done. 
Um, but I think it's quite serious that you've got these big simulations, they look really pretty, but validating them, trying to understand how they relate back to anything is really hard. Okay? Because we don't even have enough measures of the brain to really know functionally what's going on. Okay. Um, so that brings me to point number two. How do we study the mind and how the study of the mind and brain might benefit from consider, considering artificial systems? Okay. Um, because I think, you know, there's the old idea that David Marr is most strongly associated with, that computational vision and biological vision should work together hand in hand, and it kind of disappeared for the most part. Um, mostly because biological vision people didn't really know that much, and the people studying artificial vision realized that by not paying attention to biology they were able to get a lot more done. <laughs> okay, which was more important, it turned out, than making it biologically plausible. Um, so, you know, things separated out, um, but that's okay. But I think that we're at the point where we should begin to think about connecting them again. So, um, one of the ways that we can think about that is by how we understand and predict human behavior, which is a big problem that's difficult for psycho psychologists to really do. Um, so, we can facilitate it by the measurement of brain activity. That gives us access to unconscious processes and biases that you couldn't do before, and that may ultimately help artificial systems as well. Because before, when we can only tell you about overt behavior, eh. But now that we can actually say something about the way different systems are organized or the way different things get partitioned out, it might be useful in thinking about the architecture of artificial systems. Not sure. But one of the things that's also, I think, really critical is large-scale measurements of performance. Web-scale type data are going to help us ultimately be able to understand enable insights into function in a way we never could before. Because we evolved, we have this massive history, uh, ancestry that was able to take into account all the data of all of our ancestors, plus all the things that we do as babies, and all the samples we get. So trying to predict human behavior on small number, small amounts of data seems like a mistake. Okay, and the cool thing is in particular is really behavior is any artifact of human, uh, from human activity. So it's YouTube, it's all the text on the web, and so on and so on. And it begins to address this power problem. How do you get enough samples? Well, if you want to study human behavior, you can get it off the web, you can get it other ways, you can collect a large amount of data. And it's obviously something people here think about a lot. Okay, so some new models for studying human behavior. One example is web scale data, all the click data that exists. Again, this is what Google is basically doing. Um, all the text that's out there, all the images that are out there, all the videos, and in particular at CMU, Nell and Neil. I'm gonna talk a little bit about Neil in a minute. Um, the Simon Initiative, for those of you who have heard of that, it's more about learning, but they're trying to collect mass amounts of data from kids as they learn. So as kids interact with cognitive tutors and other um, computer-based systems, using all the data about how they're learning and having that back come in so you can have a lot more data about um, how they behave. Wearable technologies, you know, various people have tried to put cameras on, wear them all the time, but there's all sorts of ways you can biometrically measure how people are interacting with the world, you get a lot more data that way. And there's in particular these new instrument in environments and biometrics. And it seems, of course, the Yahoo in Mind project is one example of that. So there's all sorts of opportunities for data in a way that we never had before. So why is this important? So I want to just go back to this point. The features or parts supporting high-level vision are completely unknown. We don't know what they are. And I defy anyone in my field to tell me what they are because they don't. And if you ever read anything where they claim they know what they are, they're not telling the truth. Okay. Um, so we need better approaches. And part of the problem is if we don't know what they are, we don't have very good models. So one of the things we've been doing in my own lab is we've been taking two different approaches, both made it motivated by computer vision. One is model-based. So we can assume a given model for mid-level visual features, and we can ask whether that given model, computational model, can explain any of our neural data. And there's a huge number of models out there, right, that are recognition systems in various labs that make different assumptions about the way they process the world and what information they emphasize. And we can use all of those to try and explain the structure of the data we collect. Okay, another thing you can try and do is be a little more data-driven. It can be assumption-free in terms of what your representational assumptions are to begin with, but you can search image space very widely, web-scale data, and you can extract regularities from all that data, build essentially a weakly supervised or unsupervised model for um, vision, and from that see whether or not the particular data that you've got indicates a particular kind of model. So where do these candidate models come from? Well, I would argue that again, the computer vision models are a great place to start. And that's kind of what we've been doing. Um, and the reason why again is they make explicit representational assumptions and at a very fine grain level, um, certainly than every psychological model out there, because they have to work to some extent. 
Okay, and because they have to work, they make these assumptions, they're, they're actually coded in there, and we can use those assumptions as a um, candidate um, proxy for a particular set of assumptions about how the brain might work. And one model is to make different assumptions from another so we can see which one predicts brain data better. Okay, and so that's really this point here. They can be tested against one another and see which one's better at explaining the data. Okay, and the nice thing is, is that these modern models also rely on web scale data and they pick up these statistical regularities present in the environment in a way that before we couldn't even do that. So it's a lot more intuition before. Now we don't have to rely on intuition as much as we used to. Okay. Um, so I'm, just gonna, I'm not going to go through details of any of these experiments. I can refer you to the papers if you're curious. But here's one example from my lab. This is done by Daniel Leeds, who actually started out in robotics and then moved over into Center for Neural Basic Cognition. And we had people look at hundreds of different objects. And we tried to fit the similarity space that we obtained from the neural data for all those objects. Because you have a pattern of activity for each of the objects in your brain space. And from that you can infer similarity to a variety of different computer vision models. So there was SIF, geometric blur, shock graph, if people know what shock graphs are around here, seeing just, and a simple Gabor filter model. And this is left brain, this is the underside view, side view, this is the right brain, underside, and right view. And we're, so we're comparing all those models, and you can see actually in this particular case for these models, the SIF model did a much better job explaining brain data compared to any of the other models, except for Gabor. And what Gabor is mostly picking up is the very early visual areas where Gabor filters are mostly inspired, in fact, by the architecture of early visual areas. So we would expect, in fact, that there'd be a strong connection between those two things. Um, this, is not a, this study was not a definitive study anyway. We didn't learn that much that, okay, now we understand the system. But it's an example of how you can actually take a variety of different models, have them compete with one another to try and explain data from the brain in terms of visual processing. And I think it's an important avenue to continue to pursue. And it seems to be becoming more popular. Okay. And one goal we have within the lab, ultimately, would be to build an analysis toolkit. Let's say you took the top 10 state-of-the-art computer vision systems that made different representational assumptions. You could basically build a toolkit in which you throw in all the images that you've shown to your subjects. You could have it generate a similarity matrix for all of those pairwise combinations of all of those images. So it's making a set of predictions about the way it thinks the space of all those images should be organized. And you can compare that to data that you pick up for any given brain region. And you could then have a toolkit that any researcher that's collecting data on high-level vision could see which of the different models that make different representational assumptions are um, doing the best job predicting the set of brain data more generally. And of course, the models are always evolving. So right now, of course, models have improved since when we did this study a lot. Um, but it seems like a kind of goal that would be a great goal to have. And it's the kind of thing I think that the field as a whole would benefit because then you have more power than just your own lab. You've got everyone in the field at least trying to fit the data that they've obtained to the same candidate set of models and can look between them. So if anyone wants to do that project, let me know. Um, okay. Um, now, obviously, when I showed that graph, one of the things that probably, to those of you who do computer vision in particular, was like, where are the convolution neural networks? Because they're the hottest thing right now, or deep belief networks, sometimes they're called. Um, and lo and behold, people have gotten very excited about these things. And here's a paper that just came out at the end of last year. They've got a similarity matrix for human inferior temporal cortex, the object recognition area. They have the same thing for a monkey physiology experiment where they recorded from a monkey. And then here's the supervised um, deep convolution neural network that's supposed to be like the same kind of um, organization as human and monkey IT, and they're claiming that there's great correspondence between the two things. So there's a kind of like, oh, Eureka, we've got it solved, convolution network solve the whole thing. Um, I'm fairly skeptical for all sorts of reasons. Um, I think convolution networks overfit in some way. I haven't completely got my head around, but I'm trying to get my head around. But recently, this, Jan LeCun has demonstrated this, but this also, this particular paper came out. These are all hand-shaped images. Oh, you can't read the text. These are all hand-shaped images that obviously as people we don't really interpret them as very much. And with a 99% confidence level, I think, oh, I can't read any of these labels, but the convolution neural network assumed that this was a baseball, this was an electric guitar. Um, I forget what this is, this is a woodpecker or something, you know. So anyway, but it, it hallucinated all these objects that weren't really there. <laughs> So we've got a long way to go before we understand CNNs. They have 20 layers or more, you know, a huge number of parameters. They do some things that are quite interesting, but there's a lot that they don't do, and we need to understand a lot more about them. But they are very intriguing as something going forward. Um, so I just want to acknowledge that because it's obviously something that's become very popular. Okay, um, give you an example from work I've done with Abhinav Gupta. Um, a a postdoc of mine, Alyssa Amanoff, and Abhinav, I'm working 
together and they've been interested in scene processing. And there's a network of at least three different brain regions that all seem to be implicated in scene processing. And those three brain regions probably do slightly different things, but any time you have people observe scenes versus other kinds of non-scene-like things, this network of brain region responds. Okay, now one of the things we know is that different scenes drive this network differently, differentially. So there's a fine-grained structure. Not all scenes are created equal. And we want to understand what that fine-grained structure is, but we don't know at present, and we need a model. Now I'll just show you to rep replicate the kind of thing I showed you before for the monkey physiology, like here's a neuron, it likes ducks, it doesn't like wheelchairs or whatever. Here's these different brain regions, the three brain regions that I just showed you. And these are the top ranked scenes for each of those three brain regions. So again, you think, well, maybe you could figure out what these different brain regions are doing by analyzing the scenes that it likes the most. So again, these images are not great, but there's like some kind of subway scene here. And this, this is one of the top ranked ones here. This is, I think, a parking lot. Um, this is a conference room. But there's no obvious connection. It's a, little, it's a little calming that at least the top rank ones are the same sometimes across the regions. But there's no obvious thing that just jumps out at you when you look at the top rank scenes for driving these individual areas of the brain. So it's not like you can just say, oh, it's doing X because this thing pops out of there. So you need a more fine-grained level of analysis. And so to that end, we've been using and working with Abhinav. Some of you are probably familiar with this, Neil, never-ending image learner. Um, it's a web scale image analysis system. It's been reading the web for almost a year now, I think, maybe longer, um, images from the web. It's weekly supervised. You can, Abhinav's not here. We could tweak him about weekly supervised means. But um, it means that there's a little bit of hand coding at the beginning <laughs> is what it means mostly. But it's really not doing any supervision once it gets going. It, um, it's automatically extracting these underlying statistical regularities from web scale data, millions of images. And from that, it derives this high dimensional visual attribute space. The order is about 100 right now that's spread across low, medium, and high level visual attributes. And there are all sorts of funny things, grass texture, arc shape, crowded, modern, yellow, wave, and so on. These are just labels we put on image properties that seem to be the emergent attributes that are good at explaining the variance in the data for scene categorization. So we've been using Neil to try and predict data. Ooh, ah. There we go. Okay. The basic point here is we're correlating again Neil's representation of the similarity between all the scenes we showed it with the brain representation of similarity across those three brain regions. And what you find is that there's two models that do the best compared to a whole host of different models we used. Um, and the two are Neil and um, the sign system from Anthony Torabla. Okay. Now, one thing to note if we try and predict the data from human behavior, have people rate similarity between scenes, it does worse than our computational models. So behavioral data here would not be that helpful. So trying to extract some kind of statistical regularities and use that predict data really works the best. Okay. Um, this is just showing you this in a slightly different way. These are different brain regions, the left and right hemisphere for the three different regions that are scene selective. And, and sometimes Neil's the best, sometimes Sun's the best, sometimes scene just is the best, but they're all doing reasonably well at explaining some of the variants. And this is the kind of thing we're trying to do. This is all pilot work. Um, when we look across everything, Neil actually does account for more of the unique variants than any of the other models when you do a regression. Um, these models like Sun and Neil that rely on mid to high level visual features are the best for accounting for brain data, which is comforting. Um, they were doing better than our measures of human performance just based on behavioral data. And there seems to be some evidence within this, and again, this is preliminary, that we really do see in some of the fine-grained structures, the kinds of statistical regularities that two of the brain regions are sensitive to, a different brain region is sensitive to different statistical regularities. So we're beginning to use that as a way of bootstrapping and understanding more about them. But this is all pilot work. The nice thing is, is that people are buying this because Alyssa just got a three-year NSF grant specifically to take Neo and apply it to neural data collected in various ways working with Abhinav on this. So there's clearly interest in this kind of thing. So to give you a sense of these kinds of collaborations, there's growing interest. Um, okay, so I think we can do the last part in 15 minutes. Good. Okay, so why, why is studying all this stuff interesting to you? Maybe, and possibly useful. Beyond the fact that you all have brains, so you might want to be interested in how they work. Um, okay, so one of my points I love to make to people is this is actually a lens of a human eye. Now, albeit it's a dead human eye, so it's a little bit more cloudy than it would normally be, but if you think about a yellow onion that you would cook with, an uh, in vivo human lens looks like an onion. It's a really crappy optical device, okay? It's quite striking. 
So all the interesting stuff that happens, happens after the eye, not at the level of optics. We're really good vision machines, but we're not good vision machines because we have a really good precise optical system. We're good vision machines because we have really smart stuff working behind the scenes. Um, so how many of you know what this is? Some of you have seen this before and know what it is, but most of you probably don't. Anyone? Okay, anyone who, anyone who hasn't seen this before, can they see the cow? Does that help? No. Yeah. Okay, there's the cow. Oh, okay. If I show you this to this to you a year from now, you will see the cow instantaneously. You will not lose the ability to see the cow. It's like, so all this knowledge context is suddenly applied. One example of this, you saw the cow, you're good. Forevermore you see that cow, okay? So we're applying this knowledge in context all the time. We can use it to disambiguate, and once we've got it, we can use it. Okay, it can also screw you up. So here, you know, there's a cow, but I just primed you with cow, but there's also the two faces. So some of you apply knowledge and context in funny ways. Um, okay, I want to show you, this is mostly fun, but it's kind of cool. I want to point out to you how good or bad human perception is. And I want to make a point about human perception. So how many of you have seen this video before? Good. Well, some of you, okay, but most of you haven't. This is a real video taken, not, a, not staged or anything. Um, at, um, in Harvard Square by two Harvard researchers, and I gotta get to play, there we go. So the Harvard researcher is this guy, and this is someone who's just on the street that they walked up to and asked for directions. Okay, now watch what's gonna happen in a second. <laughs> what gives? None of you would build a robot that stupid, right? <laughs> I mean, come on. So then you go, oh, well, come on. It was they, they videotaped a thousand people and they got one that worked. But no, here, I'll show you another one. And this one, they don't have construction helmets on or anything. So it's even a little, they're not hidden at all. There's actually another woman there on the side that was looking too. Give them directions. Here they come. <laughs> Now you guys would all go, oh, I would never be fooled by this, you know, uh, my vision's better than these people, he's old, whatever, you know. Um, so I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna try and do something similar on you. Okay, so on this test, it's an awareness test. Um, basically what I want you to do, and some of you may have seen this before, so don't give it away. There's gonna be two sets of basketball players playing basketball. And you're going to count how many times the people dressed in white pass the ball to one another. And try and do it accurately, because I want to see how aware you are of how many times the ball goes back and forth. Okay, so see how accurate you can get the number of passes for the white team. How many did you get? Okay, you're right. Okay, how many of you saw the moonwalking bear? No. Some of you didn't see the moonwalking bear? Okay, they're gonna rewind it. You'll see it again. Okay, they're gonna rewind. You're gonna play it again. Okay. This is why you shouldn't text and drive. Look, walk right through the scene. Okay. Why would you build a robot this stupid? Okay. So, the whole point is, is that we're all fallible. We're built to be fallible. So if you want to study biological vision, and you want to think about these connected to machine vision, you have to understand that our perception rests on assumptions and inference, not vertical measurements, right? The goal isn't good measurements of the world. The good is good inference about the world. And context and task play a huge role in this process. So one thing I want to observe also about context and task is if those two videos I showed you in Harvard Square, did you notice anything about the perceiver and the, um, and the experimenter? They were always different socioeconomic and age differences. So in one case, it was people that were high SES Harvard people and they were dressed as construction workers. In the other case, it was an older person versus a younger person. It turns out if you make them the same peer group, like you did it with some Harvard students and it was Harvard students doing the experiment, they're much more likely to detect the change. Okay? 
So your level of vigilance, the way you treat everything in the world, context and task and socio, all that stuff is playing a role in your vigilance. Okay. Um, and it's in general, what we choose to treat as signal and what we treat as noise depends on context. And we often hallucinate things all the time. So how many, particularly the guys here, carry your cell phone in your pocket? How many of you occasionally hallucinate that the cell phone's vibrating? Okay. Now, what's really happening, it's the shower effect. It's that you've always had muscle tremors in your leg, but before cell phones existed, you had sort of filtered out those muscle tremors for your whole life, because why would you pay attention to muscle tremors? <laughs> you've ignored them. But now there's suddenly a signal that's got some of the same properties as the muscle tremors. And so your leg tremors, and you think your cell phone's ringing because you've got some of the same properties. So it's just like when you're in the shower listening for the doorbell or the phone, and some of the noise of the shower has the same properties as the doorbell or the phone, and you think it's, you're, it's, you hallucinate it. So we hallucinate all the time based on the task and what we think the potential target is, but we're inferring something based on bad data, okay? So this is just the point. We need to uncover, if we're going to study biological vision, the principles enable high functionality in the face of false alarms. And I would argue that machine vision and intelligent systems are going to have to do the same kind of thing. The trick is we're really good at recovering from those false alarms and not doing fatally bad things, <laughs> right? Or we wouldn't be here. Um, on the other hand, we allow them all the time, just like this proves, in a way that somehow enables all the other good inferences that keep us alive and keep us figuring out what the world is. So sometimes I think what happens is that machine vision systems and people at DARPA or whoever want systems that perform really, really well and never hallucinate, when the actual answer is get them to hallucinate but do really, really good inferring most of the stuff that happens in the world and let mistakes happen but recover from them quickly and easily. And I think that's a major goal of biological perception. Okay? So, so that would say that the CNNs are doing the right thing. They may be, but they need to recover and figure out why they've screwed up. Right? right now, they can't do that part. They have no introspection, as far as I know. Unless, I mean, they may have started talking at this point and gone Skynet on us, but, um, <laughs> you know. Okay, here's just another example of that. So who are, who are these? It's not Pavan Sinha and Tommy Poju, in case you're wondering. <laughs> they made it. Um, so who is that? So it's actually Clinton and Clinton. Um, <laughs> But the point is, if you have some context and you have expectations, people tend to see this as Gore and Clinton, right? Okay. Um, so, yeah, well, it is kind of, but the hair it depends what defines a person, of course. But the face is, is Clinton. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, well, Gore's isn't real anyway, is it? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, anyway. Um, just again, showing you that we need to figure out how we uncover the principles, how we deploy and enable context and knowledge to be used. It's a really hard problem, but it's the hallmark of biological perception. So I want to give you one more example, and then we'll be done. Okay. Um, this is to show you, it's not all semantic. It's not all really high level. So some of you may, how many of you have seen this demo before? A lot of you probably, it's a famous demo computer. For those of you that haven't, A and B here are exactly the same brightness in the image. Okay. But you can't really convince yourself of that, right? So, uh, don't worry, I'm going to give you the bar so you can... <laughs> there you go. Okay? But all of these other cues about shadows and occluders and so on, they tell you that they should be different levels of brightness and your brain ends up inferring that. So this is a lot about context, right? There's all this information here, and I've actually done experiments on this. If you remove the cylinder but keep the shadow, this becomes paint, and suddenly these look different from one another. So there's a lot of high-level inferences going on here, but it's not what you would really think of as a high-level process. It's certainly not a semantic process. So I think that the role of context is happening all the way up. It's not that it's just some level at the cognitive level. It's really happening at the level of all of our perception. Okay. So summarizing, why should computer scientists and brain scientists talk? I think, well, first of all, theory. We want to understand the principles of computation in biological systems, and computer scientists can hopefully help us, and maybe in doing so we'll be able to help computer scientists build and think about better systems. But theory is critical, and I think there's a dearth of theory in psychology and biology right now, neuroscience right now. The theories are weak, and the theories obviously in computer science have gotten stronger and stronger. Um, implementation, and this is really going back to what you may want to do more, is how do we build intelligent machines? Maybe we can help you figure out how to do that in different kinds of ways than you might have thought. Not just because of left brain, right brain kinds of mythology. Um, 
We also would love to be able to do simulations, large-scale simulations. How do we understand emergent phenomena in complex systems? Again, things happen at web scale that didn't happen when you had a thousand samples. So we want to be able to simulate <coughs> the brain and mind at that level. And presumably simulations are also something that are interested to computational scientists. And lastly, there is this data issue, which is how do we uncover regularities in large-scale data? So it's human behavior, it's the web, it's images in the world. All those different things. How do we actually do that? How do we do it in brain images and so on? So these are all points of contact where I think we have a lot to say to each other. We should be working closer together. CME is the kind of place where you can do that. So I'm going to leave you with my favorite quote by my favorite author, Terry Pratchett. Um, so he says, it's a popular fact that nine-tenths of the brain is not used. And like most popular facts, it is wrong. It is used. And one of its functions is to make the miraculous seem ordinary and turn the unusual into the usual. And I think that sort of sums up what we know about the brain where we'd like to go. So I'll end there. Right. So, so yeah, I'm using context as a, a knowledge, as a placeholder for all the stuff that's happened in your life, and again, and even in your ancestors' lives. So certainly memory and experience is the critical experience dependent responses are a critical part of that. Um, I think that memory is really interesting because it's messy. As you probably all know now, there's all these things in eyewitness testimony and other kinds of memories. We can put memories in and get people to actually remember things they never did. And, yeah, and one, Brian Williams right now is demonstrating that quite nicely. Um, um, that, um, that somehow, though, even with this messy kind of memory, we're able to extract these things that really play out and are effective in enabling our, our later inferences. And there is this interesting question about how much is your own life experience versus how much is pre-existing, and there's a real tension in those issues. So, question? So, yeah, again, really great and very stimulating. I'm jealous to not be you. <laughs> stuff. These, a lot of what you presented spoke to recognizing stuff, <coughs> tangible things, scenes, and I wonder, I couldn't make an argument, but I wonder if it's not more important to understand action and verb and so, of that nature more than stuff. John can raise his hand there. Um, my postdoc, John Piles, that's kind of what he studies. So he came into my lab. I didn't really do that, but he's interested in dynamic perception of things. So changeable world. What's happening and what tells you as, as the world is changing and dynamically moving, around, particularly living things, but all that and actions. And now you understand that. That, that, has, that might have more to do and, with behavior than stuff. Though. Well, right. And I think that there's an interesting, so there's multiple issues. One, I think you're exactly right. And as our technologies get better so we can both stimulus and data collection things, we can go to more realistic type of stimuli. Like you couldn't do it before at all. Now at least you could play a movie to someone, but then you don't know how to interpret the data. But you're right. And, but the other thing is, which is interesting, is that there is this division of labor that's probably a little fuzzy but very clearly there within the primate brain, where there's one pathway, which is this object pathway, which is what I've been talking about, which is really seems to be involved in telling what things are. But there's this other pathway, which is this part of the brain, they call more dorsal, the dorsal system, which seems to be much more involved in perception for action. So it's almost like the system has decided to divide and conquer, that different kinds of information are relevant to doing those two tasks. Now again, it's fuzzier than the way it comes out in some of the articles and people try and make a very clean break, but it's still true that that architecture is there. And so there's a whole other set of problems, which I don't really think that much about dorsal system processing, but that people need to look at. But I think you're right, and ultimately they come back together. And we do want to think more about verbs and actions so, as part of it. Questions? Have you heard about the Lego worm? The Lego worm. It was supposed to be something like a 32-node neural network that was implemented, like taken from a worm's brain and then implemented oh. into like a little Lego thing. Right. There's, there, there's a group of people, you know, Rod Brooks probably um, was the first person doing this, basically trying to build systems that were based on insects. And didn't, I mean, there's some real, you can build a good cockroach now. You know, and um, there certainly are 
a, a lot of systems where there's a simple architecture of the nervous system that seems to be very powerful for the behavior at the level of insect and uh, avoidance behavior and contact behavior and so on. And, uh, and those systems work well and they're fairly tractable. But things scale up really quickly when you get to vertebrates and all bets are off again. And like just doing like, you know, as, as Alex Puget commented on just a slice of mouse cortex where he just thinks it's garbage, they can't even do that, and they don't really know it's all connected. But the insectoid work is, is very interesting, and I think has been promising, and, 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 pe and I, I know how he chose it in a snake robots, is very interested in snake behavior and tries to build into it, even if he's not mimicking the nervous system directly. So there's certainly these different levels of things in analysis, and you learn something from that. But I want to get to the point, we're talking about generalization, learning from small numbers examples, all the things that make us human also, which goes far beyond what you can do with a worm. David. So, it might be interesting to have you comment on a couple of past cases where there's been this attempt to have this fertilization between the right. computing and biological that didn't seem to peter out. So, so one of them is um, all these visual routines. Right. Uh, was this proposal for intermediate level vision that um, a lot of people use that term <coughs> routines, but they don't always mean the same thing. Right. And it, does, it seems to fizzle. But, and then the other one I wanted to throw out is affordances, which <laughs> is widely abused. Um, so, so what do you think about those cases? Um, so the Ullman visual routine thing was really a framework more than anything else. He didn't really quantify anything specifically. Um, and he, it, was more, it was more almost a framework for how to go study some problems, I would say, than it was a direct connection between the two things. The interesting thing is that people within the biological side just decided to toss it all out the window and ignored it. They didn't know how it was useful to them. And, I mean, part of it is coming up with the right problems at the right level of structure that you can say something meaningful on both sides and no one's bullshitting the other, if you pardon the French. Because it's too easy to say, yeah, I think I understand this problem where you really don't. It's really hard to specify what you really know in a way that's meaningful that can make predictions on both sides. And so I think Ullman has really was a great promoter and still continues to be a great promoter of trying to make these connections. But even still, sometimes you can articulate something, but how you operationalize that's really difficult. The, as far as the affordance thing, that comes from J.J. Gibson back in the 50s. It was this idea that there's this functional knowledge um, coming out of what an object is. But that relates back to what Jim was saying. I think that you can recast affordance as being trying to understand action and the functional roles of things beyond their shape and their appearance per se. And I think that's all you can take out of it because Gibson was really a philosopher, not a psychologist. And he didn't really make any strong predictions. He was just making the point that we need to worry about that level of analysis not just the level of analysis of seeing the world vertically and analyzing its structure. And so I think that's a really valuable tool. The funny thing is psychologists have sort of given up on that to a large extent. We need to bring them back to thinking about that. But it was them and then yeah. So the resolving of hallucinations, um, how much do you think that's a function that, you know, of incorporating other sensibilities like auditory, but right. also sort of <laughs> Right, so I think that's right. So there's multiple, we have multi-sensory, sensory, and the multi-sensing is really useful for disambiguating things often. And there's things like the McGurk effect where you can disambiguate um, ambiguous auditory signals based on the visual signal. Um, so that helps you. You're right, these illusions don't always persist so that you don't have a stability, so they fall, like the Penrose Triangle, falls apart easily. Um, but there's also just the fact that I think you tend to validate things all the time. So my favorite example of that is, how many of you have ever had a dog around? A dog. What, what does a dog do when it's confused? Tilt its head. Tilt its head. Why does a dog tilt its head when it's confused? What? Mm, I don't think so. I think it's because dogs are disambiguating confusing situations. So humans may do that too when there's something, so we move around, we move our eyes, we move our bodies, we, so, but I think that dogs, have, because they're not that bright, they're dogs, they've, they've overgeneralized between confusion visually where they try and disambiguate by moving their head to confusion cognitively for them when you give them an instruction they don't understand, they tilt their head. My own personal theory, I have no proof for it. But it's as good as anyone's theory as far as I can tell. But in general, I think that we do a lot of that kind of thing. We're constantly iterating through and reconstructing our world. And that's part of why also, by the way, those two Harvard Square illusions work where the person walked by and it turned to a different person, is you're constantly iterating and revalidating. So in some sense, you can think about the whole slate being wiped clean to at least some structural level. And, and that's usually a good strategy, not a bad strategy, because the world tends to persist in a fairly constant way. So if it's an illusion, it goes away, you're better off. Has, sorry, has, has anyone looked at the duration of the interruption? 
they've played around a little with it in other domains, not quite that real world example, and they have. And um, it's, it's, it's not long, la if you, if you, well at some point you break down completely, you have no memory. If you make it too short, you begin to pick up more because you get motion artifacts. So, but there is some of that. There was a question up there and then I'll get to you. Right. Um, one of the things that's always struck me about these approaches is that humans do a large amount of abstraction, right? It's impossible for us to perceive every single thing right. all the time. <coughs> so back to compression and expansion <coughs> thing I'm suspecting. Um, my concern with some of these approach these model based approaches where you try and simulate what people are doing and compare it back to the results is that we're we don't have good expressions of this abstraction or, or expansion problem. Yeah, I 100% agree. The, the model-based approaches are purely to try and explicate something about mid-level processing, how you get from low-level features to high-level objects. And obviously semantics and knowledge could play a role in that that we don't have. And, and actually the DARPA grant that I started working on with Marshall when we originally started this stuff, that's what it was really about, but we've never been able to quite answer that question of how you bring that back in. But ultimately, you'd like to be able to do that as well. But for the, I, and so I agree that those models, as they currently stand, aren't meant to do that. And you're right, that whole knowledge context abstraction, how you, how you build these world models is something beyond any of that. I mean, it is kind of the thing that John Anderson tries to do in his ACTAR framework. He's trying, in, that, in that case, that's, that's really the level where he's working at. Is there another question there? Right. And as long as there's someone in that role, right. Then That's right. You can think of it as an old cognitive model back from the 70s. It's like a slot. Yeah. And the person's slot is filled. And probably if you turned it from a male to a female, they would notice. But as long as it's a male of a particular, it's OK. Yeah. Right. So I guess how much does that uh, person fitting a role versus recognizing a person? But if you would ask the person, did you recognize that person? Could you identify them again? For instance, let's say there was a crime that it turned out they had committed a crime. They probably say, oh yeah, I saw them very clearly. I gave them directions. So your experience, again, glosses over the fact that you're actually making, you're kind of fallow making these generalizations all the time. And, I, and the funny thing is, what they didn't do, which I wish they'd done, is I wish they'd later on done a face recognition test with the same subjects. They couldn't because they were the experimenters, so they would have had to get it. But, they, they, man, it could, but can you imagine they then showed them a face recognition for familiar, unfamiliar faces, just seeing whether they recognized the two individuals that they saw or not? Or did they just recognize one? How, what, what did they do with that? You can imagine different things you could learn from that. Was there another question over here? All right. Well, thank you guys very much.